Hello, this is Dr. Alan Yim. Today I'm going to be talking about chord symbols and figured bass. They are related and uh, this is a review of how they work. So first of all, you see here, this is a typical lead sheet. Uh, you're probably very familiar with this. And it's just the melody with the words and some chord symbols. The chord symbols in this are very simple. They put it in the key of C. So first of all, you notice it begins with a C major chord. If, if you see the letter by itself, it's just a major triad. The second one is an E minor chord over B. Okay, so the M indicates that this is a minor triad and the slash over B indicates the bass note. And with your theory knowledge, you know that this is an inverted chord. B is the fifth of the chord, so this is a second inversion E minor triad. And then the next chord, so this is, looks like a passing chord, if you think about it, because it's 6-4, and then A minor. Happens that Billy Joel was classically trained, so he has a nice linear stepwise bass line here, A minor triad, and then a C over G, which you know, again, is a second inversion C chord. So C major triad over G, F, followed by F root position chord, first inversion C, D7, this is a secondary dominant, a 5-7 of 5-7. Okay, so when I play the chords in a progression, you'll recognize it as the progression for this tune. Let's take a look at another one. I, um, one thing I want you to notice here as I move to the next one is that look at minor here, it's a little M. And in the next one here, a little Beatles tune, this one, the minor chord is indicated by a minus. Chord symbols are not standardized. So as you go from one chart to the next, you just have to recognize that everybody has their own little way of writing minor. Um, sometimes you use triangle for major, sometimes you use a minus sign for minor. But in my class, for theory class, we're going to stick to one system so we don't get confused, so I don't show you a bunch of different versions. Also, this little minus here, which is a minor, can be confused for a lot of other things. So when I show you the chord symbols I want you to use in just a few minutes, Use those and stick to those for this class. And if you feel like you want to use something different when you write out your charts, hey, no problem. But <laughs> there are some other things to notice um, that are not typical of classical music, and that is the key, the way it's written. So look at the key signature and the clef and the time signature in this. This is a typical thing where they start off, and you see, just like classical music, it goes clef, key time. So treble clef, one sharp in three four. But if you look at the next line, they don't have the clef, they don't have the key signature, and they will only show the time signature if it changes as it does in the second measure and in the sixth measure it looks like, right? Actually the fifth. So unless something changes, they don't write it. They only write it once. Well, for classical musicians, um, I'll tell you right now, I sort of get used to looking to the left to see that that key signature and the clef because in a piece of classical music, the, the key changes so often that it's kind of easy to lose your place if it's not repeated. And everything else, when it goes away from the original key, they use accidentals. So without having that key signature there to remind you, sometimes it can get a little bit confusing if, if, if there's a lot of key changing going, a lot of modulation. So don't do that when you write classical. Always put the clef and the key. The meter, you can, you can just write that once and then whenever it changes. But every line that you write should have the clef and the key. Okay, so this one begins in G, and then it's at A minor seven, and then a G, and then a C. This is kind of like the opposite of what we just saw because it has a nice ascending and descending 
bass line. So if you don't think that pop, jazz, rock, good composers aren't thinking about the bass, soprano, how they're working, I think you'd be wrong. They, they are thinking very carefully about the melodies in the bass line as well as the melody of the melody, the soprano that we all pay attention to. So it's... Everybody recognizes too. These chords are pretty simple still. I'll take a look at one more. I'm not a jazz player, so I am not I don't even know this tune. But um, and most of these chords you recognize they're very similar to what we just saw. One of the things to notice is how long it stays on this A flat minor seven chord. Okay, so that lasts for quite a long time, and then it goes to F sharp minor seven, then B7, A E major seven. A7, okay, all of those chords should, whoops, that's not a B flat, <laughs> okay, I think a minor 7th chord, I think that's the, the prettiest sounding chord to my ear. And the last chord, let's just quickly, be, um, you're, you're going to see this both in the, in the Baroque version of chord symbols and in, you know, chord symbols themselves, notice this has an alteration, a sharp 9, so this is an E flat 7, a dominant 7th, with the ninth. Well, what's a ninth? Okay, if they don't write an explicit accidental altering a, uh, a scale degree, nine in the key of E flat is like two, so it's F natural, and sharp nine is F sharp. So I might play this chord like this, right? It's interesting that down below, you see the sharp nine is written as G flat. Okay, so they have flats below. I guess maybe this is just an example of enharmonic writing. To, in one case, it's to help the singer or the, the person who, yeah, the person who's playing the melody. And then up above, of course, the chord player might be thinking slightly differently. All right. Not an expert on these jazz pieces, but that's basically how chord symbols work. Now, in classical music, it's a little bit simpler. So let's take a look at how chord symbols work in classical music. It's simpler because we don't have so many alterations. For example, we don't use augmented chords very often, if ever. I think I've seen one um, minor major chord, <laughs> this, this um, seventh chord. So I think I've seen this in one piece in the 19th century. You can search it out, but these chords are extremely hard to find, minor major sevenths. Um, so let's take a look. Here, here's what the chord symbols look like. I wrote in blue to indicate the part of the chord that you have to write. So you have to have the root, you have to have the quality if it's something other than a major triad, and if the chord is inverted, you have to have a slash and the bass note. So the only part that might be a little bit complicated here is the quality part. So I'll, I'll talk about that first and then I'll show you some examples. So again, for chord symbols, it's not standardized. So I have to pick how I'm going to indicate these. When you write them, if you don't like the way I'm writing it, and you go off and you want to make a triangle for something major, feel free, but please don't do it in my class because I want it, everybody's work to look uniform and I don't want to actually um, also present these things using different symbols. I don't want you to be confused. So triads. For us, a major triad 
nothing. This is the only one that has no modifier. A minor triad, we're going to use a lowercase m. A diminished triad, we're going to use a little circle. Now if you're using um, a keyboard and you're typing out your chord symbols, a little lowercase zero, sorry, O, letter O, will work well. Augmented. For us, we're going to use a plus sign. Some people write aug or put a or plus, um, some other symbols. This is the easiest plus. Okay, we're not going to be use, using diminished triads in this class normally, so you'll never have to worry about that plus sign in a chord symbol normally. Seventh chords. There are five that we use, so we don't use all these variants as many as exist. So we'll start with the major. So the major seventh is going to be uppercase M. Make sure your uppercase M is pointy and about the same size as the seven. Don't make it a rounded tip or kind of ambiguous. Make it exactly the same size as that seven or make the M a little bit even bigger would help. Okay, a minor seventh, you're gonna see why, is a lowercase m with a seven. You have to be careful when you write these m's because they can be confused. So make sure your, your lowercase m is small, like this, half the size of the seven and the other one really big. The most common type of seventh chord is the dominant seventh. So this is a major minor seventh, a major triad, with a minor seventh from the root of it to the seventh. Since it's so common, because we have five seven all the time, we're just going to put a seven. And then half diminished and fully diminished seven. Okay, so I'm gonna abbreviate diminish because I just am feeling so lazy. I don't wanna write out that whole diminished, fully diminished. All right, earlier I typed up some things to help you. The half diminished looks like this. All right, that little lowercase letter O with a slash through it does exist on your computer. It's, I think it's a Swedish letter. So if you could find it on, the, on a Mac, you just hold down the letter O and it thing pops up and you choose the number that has the slash through it. And that makes that lowercase slash O. I don't know what you do on a PC because I don't use PCs. Fully diminished 7 looks like that. Lowercase o, 7. And that's it. Those are the modifiers that we're going to use in this class for chord symbols. So it's quite simple to write these things. Let's suppose I want to write, for example, I don't know, a C minor 7th and 1st inversion. So C, first I'm going to write Looking back over here, C minor 7, the root is C. The quality is minor 7. It's in first inversion, so I have to put a slash, and the third is in the base. So I'm going to put an E flat. You thought I was going to forget. <laughs> okay, C minor 7 sounds like this uh, over E flat. I mean, there's many ways of playing this chord. All right, I think that's enough to refresh you about how chord symbols work. Now I'm going to talk about how figured bass works. And keep in mind that figured bass, again, is just the Baroque version of these lead sheet symbols. And that the keyboard player, just like a jazz keyboard player, is part of a group that, and that player improvises. So just like the other players can improvise, um, believe it or not, in the Baroque period, yes. If you've ever sung a Baroque song or a Baroque aria and it repeats, that singer is expected to ornament and embellish on it and improvise just like a jazz singer would improvise when they sing. So back in the Baroque, there was a lot of improvisation going on. Perhaps the only person who didn't improvise so much was maybe the bass player, but even the bass player was also free to improvise, so the um, score was sort of just 
like in jazz, a guide for what the musicians were supposed to do. Okay, let's go on now to the figure bass. So here's a picture of the opening of Handel's Messiah, actually the, the Hallelujah Chorus from the Messiah. And you can see the bass line, the first three major sounds like this. <laughs> played a few chords along with this and you may be wondering where are these chords coming from because as the keyboard player everything that I'm playing is actually being told to me in this I would not normally play the bass line because that's played by the basses but I would be playing those chords so how do I know what chords to play well I use those figured bass symbols that uh, are indicated below the bass line and this is sort of the Baroque version of chord symbols. It's, it's the flip of it. So you get the bass line and the figured basses, figured bass numbers, and then from that, as a keyboard player, I would improvise that. Not playing the bass line because the, that's the bass part. All right. Uh, you could see here that there are sixes, there's a four, there's threes. The threes look a little bit like fives, actually. So in measure three, that, that beat... Uh, two, the, the end of two has a three, so the numbers there are six, four, and three, not five, four, five. It looks a little bit hard to read. Most of these numbers you should recognize, and I'm going to go over them in detail in just a minute, but six, of course, is a first inversion triad, so if you look at measure three, that, that E natural over the six, well, we're in the key of D, that's a first inversion chord, so we know that that bass note there is the third of the chord. The root of that chord is C sharp. So um, the chord there is, is a C sharp diminished chord. So, um, all right, so it's E, G, and C sharp. And that's that chord. The second chord has a four. Now, we're not used to seeing a four, but Figured basses indicate the interval above the bass. So um, that four applies to the A on beat two. So it goes, and a fourth above A is D. So this is actually a six four chord. They left out the six. And the notes in that chord are D, F sharp, and A. This is a D triad over A, one, one, six, four. Okay. And then the next chord, of course, is that if there's a three there, so you have to play the third above the bass, which is C sharp, and that low A, C sharp, and E. Of course, I would not play way down there, but that chord is, um, it's an A root position chord. It's five. And then, of course, the last note in that measure, and last note in measure three, is D. It's D in the bass, and it's a root position chord. So again, in summary... First chord, C sharp diminished over E, followed by D, and then D over A. That's that little number four there. A, it's root position, and then one, D. Actually, I'm, I'm, I'm noticing that four, three, hmm, that three's a little bit suspicious there. I'm wondering if that's a I'm wondering why you needed that there. Hmm. Okay. Not sure. I, I guess that's to indicate that the chord has changed. Now, there are some, some other interesting things happening. As you look through this, there are some alterations that maybe you don't notice. Take a look down at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, the fifth system. Most of those symbols you probably recognize. Not sure what after that 7 is. If that's a seven six six five, you know it's first inversion. But look at the second measure. You see four plus over two. I'm going to go over that um, in just a second. But the plus is an indication to raise that note. So the fourth above the bass is going to be raised up. That note there, the half note is a D. A fourth above D is G diatonically, and we're going to raise it up to G sharp. 
So let's figure out what this chord is. It's a, it's a third inversion seventh chord, but one way to look at this is there's a second above that note, there's an E, there's a G sharp, there's something else, and there's D. Well, the something else, of course, is B. So the chord is E, G, sharp, B, and D. It's an E sharp seven chord. So that looks like a secondary dominant. It looks like a five of five in the key of D. So it's E seven over D. And we need that little plus sign there to raise it up to G sharp in order to make it a dominant seventh chord. Okay, so here we are again. And reminder, in Baroque music, the bass is given to you if you're a keyboard player and the figure bass. So the figure bass are those little numbers underneath. In a typical um, chamber group in the in the Baroque, this grouping was called the basso continuo, which basically was the bass line plus the chord player, whether it be a, an organ, a harpsichord, a lute, playing along with, with a, a string bass or maybe a bassoon. Sometimes it could be one player. I mean, if you're an organist, you could play the bass and the chords, so you could play everything all at once. But usually there was a separate bass player, just like in a, a band or a, a jazz ensemble. Okay, now, down below here, I'm going to show this in the key of C. And you probably already recognize these figured bass symbols. On the left, these are, of course, triads. And on the right, these are the seventh chords. So you just have to kind of memorize these. I've put them from left to right in root position through the inversions. And uh, they are also indicative of the intervals that you will find above the bass. And they, you could write every single number you know, in the chord in every single interval above it. But of course, that would be a lot of numbers, and your your figured bass line would, would be a mess if you put every single number in. So, for example, look at the root position triad. When you write music, this is the most common chord. I'm, I could write 5-3 above this, and then you would know, okay, I play a diatonic fifth and third above the bass, and we know that's a C major chord, okay? But, again, everything that I put in blue here um, down below is, are numbers we don't normally use. I'm going to erase them in a second. Okay, in a first inversion chord, there's a sixth above the bass. Now, what's usually omitted is the third because, so this is, um, whoops, <laughs> I was about to write C. This is not C. This is A minor over C. Now, in a first inversion chord, the third is in the bass, right? So, first First inversion, the third's in the bass. Second inversion, well, what's in the bass? The fifth. Okay, so this is second inversion, and it looks like this. I'm going to write a fourth above the bass, and I'm going to write a sixth above the bass, diatonic. This is F over C. Okay, I'm just keeping the bass the same, just for convenience, it's staying on the line. All right, so here, the one that's missing in the, there is the third. So there's a complete figured bass. The blue we normally omit. Let's go to the seventh chords. All right, if I write a seventh above the bass, well, if I write a seventh chord above this, it's going to look like this. This is a C major seven chord. This is root position. And obviously we don't put the five and we don't put the three. Six, five. A fifth above this is G, a sixth above this is A. Again, the note that we're leaving out is the E. And this is A minor 7 over C. It's first in, we recognize 6 5 as first inversion. Okay, how did I do it here? Oh. Okay, so when you see a 6 5, it's a first inversion 7th chord. And Whoops, uh oh. This bass note is the third, and it's first inversion. I hope I'm not confusing you with this. This is all kind of review. 
Second one, if this is there's a third above the base and a fourth above the base. Okay, what note is missing from this? Well, it's this A. So there, there, there could be a six here, but if we put the six, then we're gonna get confused with six four, right? So they usually don't, we don't put the six. And this in the base here, this is the fifth, and this is a second inversion, seventh chord. And lastly, this is of course going to be the seventh of the chord. We write a fourth. This is a kind of a different way of looking at it because this is not the way we looked at it before. All right, and up above, what note are we missing? We're missing the A. So again, we didn't we didn't put in the six for two. Sometimes this chord is just abbreviated as two. All right, but. But the one, the numbers you see in black, that that's what we normally use for the the figured base uh, when we're doing analysis. Okay, so this third chord here, this is F major seven over C, and this one here, this is D minor seven over C. So I'll just let you hear what these sound like from left to right. C major chord, A minor over C. F over C, okay, C major 7, A minor 7 over C, F major 7 over C, and finally D minor 7 over C. Now, of course, these, these chords would not be voiced like this. I just wrote them this like this, and I played them as you see them. But if I could just put the chord up above. you're going to get a few more variations of this uh, but now let's take a look at the very last thing we need to, to, to see to understand this because there are some variants of course sometimes you raise up parts of the chord or lower them and how do you show that in figured bass and as I mentioned before in minor for example well if you have a key signature of course you don't need to change anything but what if you go outside of the key for example if you have a secondary chord, if you have a non-chord tone, what do you do with the figured bass to tell the player that they need to alter this chord? So let's suppose we have a, I don't know, how about a C, whoops. Let's take a, something with like a sharp five or like let's say, what if we had a D7 with a sharp five? Okay, so D7, but we want it to be Okay, sounds pretty horrible the way I have a voice there. Let's see, um, how about like, this? like that, okay, for example. Okay, that's what happens when you play with one hand and you're writing with the other one. Okay, what, is it, what does it look like in the key of, well, let's say, let's make it G to make it easy. So we're gonna make this the five chord. Well, it's five, okay, and it's gonna be a seven, and now we want to sharp the five. Well, we could do it like this, sharp five. Okay, so in the figure base, we could do it like this. In the Baroque, they might have written things like, they might have written it, hmm. They did tend to stack it, but I don't know, if that, that doesn't look right to me. Okay, other times they will put a slash through the number. Okay, so slash also means they didn't really use this chord, so it looks really weird to me. Um, five with a slash, all right? If you want to lower a pitch, um, you just put the, the number before it. So let's say you're doing a, a, on a flat five, it might look like that, okay? Or if, it's, if the note is already, you know, sharp, you might have to put a natural before it. If you see an accidental all by itself, okay, so let's suppose, I know in, the, in some of the homeworks you might see something like this, seven, and then you see a sharp here, but it has nothing next to it, okay, nothing next to it means that you're going to alter the third above the base, okay, third above the base. 
So something to keep in mind is that these accidentals by the numbers, it's always that interval above the base. If you're confused about it, without an accidental, you just play the diatonic note above the base, as I showed you before. But if you see an accidental next to number, you have to alter it from the diatonic. If it's a sharp, raise it. If it's a flat, lower it. And if it's a natural, whatever it is in the key signature normally, let's say it's a sharp and it has a natural, you'll be lowering it. If it's a flat, it cancels out that flat and raises it up. Okay, I think that's it for today. I hope this helps you with understanding chord symbols and figured bass. As always, if you have questions, let me know, and I will see you at the next video. Thanks.